Section 3 of The Oxford Book of American Essays Chosen by Brander Matthews This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3 Keene's Acting by Richard Henry Dana For, doubtless, that indeed, according to art, is most eloquent, which turns and approaches nearest to nature from whence it came. Milton Professed diversions, cannot these escape? We ransack tombs for pastime from the dust, call up the sleeping hero, bid him tread the scene for our amusement. How like gods we sit, and wrapped in immortality shed generous tears on wretches born to die, their fate deploring to forget our own. Young. I had scarcely thought of the theatre for some years when Keene arrived in this country, and it was more from curiosity than from any other motive that I went to see, for the first time, the great actor of the age. I was soon lost to the recollection of being in a theatre or looking upon a great display of the mimic art. The simplicity earnestness and sincerity of his acting made me forgetful of the fiction and bore me away with the power of reality and truth if this be acting said i as i returned home i may as well make the theatre my school and henceforward study nature at second hand how can i describe one who is almost as full of beauties as nature itself who grows upon us the more we become acquainted with him, and makes us sensible that the first time we saw him in any part, however much he may have moved us, we had but a partial apprehension of the many excellences of his acting. We cease to consider it a mere amusement. It is an intellectual feast, and he who goes to it with a disposition and a capacity to relish it will receive from it more nourishment for his mind than he would be likely to do in many other ways in twice the time our faculties are opened and enlivened by it our reflections and recollections are of an elevated kind and the voice which is sounding in our ears long after we have left him creates an inward harmony which is for our good keen in truth stands very much in that relation to other players whom we have seen that shakespeare does to other dramatists one player is called classical another makes fine points here and another there keen makes more fine points than all of them together but in him these are only little prominences showing their bright heads above a beautifully undulated surface a continual change is going on in him, partaking of the nature of the varying scenes he is passing through, and the many thoughts and feelings which are shifting within him. In a clear autumnal day we may see, here and there, a massed white cloud edged with a blazing brightness against a blue sky, and now and then a dark pine swinging its top in the wind, with the melancholy sound of the sea. But who can note the shifting and untiring play of the leaves of the wood, and their passing hues, when each seems a living thing full of sensations, and happy in its rich attire? A sound, too, of universal harmony is in our ears, and a widespread beauty before our eyes, which we cannot define yet a joy is in our hearts. Our delight increases in these day after day, the longer we give ourselves to them, till at last we become, as it were, a part of the existence without us. So it is with natural characters. They grow upon us imperceptibly, till we become bound up in them. We scarce know when or how. So, in its degree, it will fare with the actor who is deeply filled with nature and is perpetually throwing off her evanescences. 
instead of becoming tired of him as we do after a time of others he will go on giving something which will be new to the observing mind and will keep the feelings alive because their action will be natural i have no doubt that excepting those who go to a play as children look into a show-box to admire and exclaim at distorted figures and raw unharmonious colours there is no man of a moderately warm temperament and with a tolerable share of insight into human nature who would not find his interest in keen increasing with a study of him it is very possible that the excitement would lessen but there would be a quieter pleasure instead of it stealing upon him as he became familiar with the character of the acting taken within his range of characters the versatility of his playing is striking he seems not the same being now representing richard and again hamlet but the two characters alone appear before you and as distinct individuals who had never known or heard of each other so does he become the character he is to represent that we have sometimes thought it a reason why he was not universally better liked here in richard and that because the player did not make himself a little more visible he must needs bear a share of our dislike of the cruel king and this may be still more the case as his construction of the character whether right or wrong creates in us an unmixed dislike of richard till the anguish of his mind makes him the object of pity from which time to the close all allow that he plays the part better than any one has done before him in his highest wrought passion when the limbs and muscles are alive and quivering and his gestures hurried and vehement nothing appears ranted or overacted because he makes us feel that with all this there is something still within him struggling for utterance the very breaking and harshness of his voice in these parts help to this impression and make up in a good degree for this defect if it be a defect here though he is on the very verge of truth in his passionate parts he does not fall into extravagance but runs along the dizzy edge of the roaring and beating sea with feet as sure as we walk our parlours we feel that he is safe for some preternatural spirit upholds him as it hurries him onward and while all is uptorn and tossing in the whirl of the passions we see that there is a power and order over the whole a man has feelings sometimes which can only be breathed out there is no utterance for them in words i had hardly written this when the terrible ha with which keen makes lear hail cornwall and regan as they enter in the fourth scene of the second act came to my mind that cry seemed at the time to take me up and sweep me along in its wild swell no description in the world could give a tolerably clear notion of it it must be formed as well as it may be from what is here said of its effect keen's playing is sometimes but the outbreaking of inarticulate sounds the throttled struggle of rage and the choking of grief the broken laugh of extreme suffering when the mind is ready to deliver itself over to an insane joy the utterance of overall love which cannot and would not speak in express words and that of wildering grief which blanks all the faculties of man no other player whom i have heard has attempted these except now and then and should any one have made the trial in the various ways in which keen gives them probably he would have failed keen thrills us with them as if they were wrung from him in his agony they have not the appearance of study or artifice the truth is that the labour of a mind of his genius constitutes its existence and delight it is not like the toil of ordinary men at their 
task work what shows effort in them comes from him with the freedom and force of nature some object to the frequent use of such sounds and to others they are quite shocking but those who permit themselves to consider that there are really violent passions in man's nature and that they utter themselves a little differently from our ordinary feelings understand and feel their language as they speak to us in keen probably no actor has conceived passion with the intenseness and life that he does it seems to enter into him and possess him as evil spirits possessed men of old it is curious to observe how some who have sat very contentedly year after year and called the face-making which they have seen expression and the stage stride dignity and the noisy declamation and all the rhodomontade of acting energy and passion complain that keen is apt to be extravagant when in truth he seems to be little more than a simple personation of the feeling or passion to be expressed at the time it has been so common a saying that lear is the most difficult of characters to personate that we have taken it for granted no man could play it so as to satisfy us perhaps it is the hardest to represent yet the part which has generally been supposed the most difficult the insanity of lear is scarcely more so than that of the choleric old king inefficient rage is almost always ridiculous and an old man with a broken-down body and a mind falling in pieces from the violence of its uncontrolled passions is in constant danger of exciting along with our pity a feeling of contempt it is a chance matter to which we may be most moved and this it is which makes the opening of lear so difficult we may as well notice here the objection which some make to the abrupt violence with which keen begins in lear if this be a fault it is shakespeare and not keen who is to blame for no doubt he has conceived it according to his author perhaps however the mistake lies in this case where it does in most others with those who put themselves into the seat of judgment to pass upon great men in most instances shakespeare has given us the gradual growth of a passion with such little accompaniments as agree with it and go to make up the whole man in lear his object being to represent the beginning and course of insanity he has properly enough gone but a little back of it and introduced to us an old man of good feelings enough but one who has lived without any true principle of conduct and whose unruled passions had grown strong with age and were ready upon a disappointment to make shipwreck of an intellect never strong to bring this about he begins with an abruptness rather unusual and the old king rushes in before us with his passions at their height and tearing him like fiends king gives this as soon as the fitting occasion offers itself had he put more of melancholy and depression and less of rage into the character we should have been much puzzled at his so suddenly going mad it would have required the change to have been slower and besides his insanity must have been of another kind it must have been monotonous and complaining instead of continually varying at one time full of grief at another playful and then wild as the winds that roared about him and fiery and sharp as the lightning that shot by him the truth with which he conceived this was not finer than his execution of it not for a moment in his utmost violence did he suffer the imbecility of the old man's anger to touch upon the ludicrous when nothing but the justest conception and feeling of the character could have saved him from it 
It has been said that Lear is a study for one who would make himself acquainted with the workings of an insane mind, and it is hardly less true that the acting of Cain was an embodying of these workings. His eye, when his senses are first forsaking him, giving an inquiring look at what he saw, as if all before him was undergoing a strange and bewildering change which confused his brain, the wandering, lost motions of his hands, which seemed feeling for something familiar to them, on which they might take hold and be assured of a safe reality, the under-monotone of his voice, as if he was questioning his own being, and what surrounded him, the continuous but slight oscillating motion of the body all these expressed with fearful truth the bewildered state of a mind fast unsettling and making vain and weak efforts to find its way back to its wonted reason there was a childish feeble gladness in the eye and a half piteous smile about the mouth at times which one could scarce look upon without tears as the derangement increased upon him his eye lost its notice of objects about him wandering over things as if he saw them not and fastening upon the creatures of his crazed brain the helpless and delighted fondness with which he clings to edgar as an insane brother is another instance of the justness of keen's conceptions nor does he lose the air of insanity even in the fine moralizing parts and where he inveighs against the corruptions of the world there is a madness even in his reason the violent and immediate changes of the passions in lear so difficult to manage without jarring upon us are given by keen with a spirit and with a fitness to nature which we had hardly thought possible these are equally well done both before and after the loss of reason the most difficult scene in this respect is the last interview between lear and his daughters goneril and regan and how wonderfully does keen carry it through the scene which ends with the horrid shout and cry with which he runs out mad from their presence as if the very brain had taken fire the last scene which we are allowed to have of shakespeare's lear for the simply pathetic was played by keen with unmatched power we sink down helpless under the oppressive grief it lies like a dead weight upon our hearts we are denied even the relief of tears and are thankful for the shudder that seizes us when he kneels to his daughter in the deploring weakness of his crazed grief it is lamentable that keen should not be allowed to show his unequalled powers in the last scene of lear as shakespeare wrote it and that this mighty work of genius should be profaned by the miserable mawkish sort of by-play of edgar's and cordelia's loves nothing can surpass the impertinence of the man who made the change but the folly of those who sanctioned it when i began i had no other intention than that of giving a few general impressions made upon me by keen's acting but falling accidentally upon his leer i have been led unawares into particulars it is only to take these as some of the instances of his powers in leer and then to think of him as not inferior in his other characters and some notion may be formed of the effect of keen's playing upon those who understand and like him neither this nor anything i might add would be likely to reach his great and various powers if it could be said of any one it might be said of keen that he does not fall behind his author but stands forward the living representative of the character he has drawn when he is not playing in shakespeare he fills up where his author is wanting and when in shakespeare he gives not only what is set down but whatever the situation and circumstances attendant upon the being he personates 
would naturally call forth he seems at times to have possessed himself of shakespeare's imagination and to have given it body and form read any scene in shakespeare for instance the last of lear that is played and see how few words are there set down and then remember how keen fills out with varied and multiplied expression and circumstances and the truth of this remark will be obvious enough there are few men i believe let them have studied the plays of shakespeare ever so attentively who can see keen in them without confessing that he has helped them to a truer and fuller conception of the author notwithstanding what their own labours had done for them it is not easy to say in what character keen plays best he so fits himself to each in turn that if the effect he produces at one time is less than at another it is because of some inferiority in stage effect in the character othello is probably the character best adapted to stage effect and keen has an uninterrupted power over us in playing it when he commands we are awed when his face is sensitive with love and love thrills in his soft tones all that our imaginations had pictured to us is realized his jealousy his hate his fixed purposes are terrific and deadly and the groans wrung from him in his grief have the pathos and anguish of esau's when he stood before his old blind father and sent up an exceeding bitter cry again in richard how does he hurry forward to his object sweeping away all between him and it the world and its affairs are nothing to him till he gains his end he is all life and action and haste he fills every part of the stage and seems to do all that is done i have said before that his voice is harsh and breaking in its high tones in his rage but that this defect is of little consequence in such places nor is it well suited to the more declamatory parts this again is scarce worth considering for how very little is there of mere declamation in good english plays but it is one of the finest voices in the world for all the passions and feelings which can be uttered in the middle and lower tones in lear if you have poison for me i will drink it and again you do me wrong to take me out of the grave thou art a soul in bliss why should i cite passages can any man open upon the scene in which these are contained without keen's piteous looks and tones being present to him and does not the mere resemblance of them as he reads bring tears into his eyes yet once more in othello had it pleased heaven to try me with affliction etc in the passage beginning with oh now forever farewell the tranquil mind there was a mysterious confluence of sounds passing off into infinite distance and every thought and feeling within him seemed travelling with them how graceful he is in othello it is not a practised educated grace but the unbought grace of his genius uttering itself in its beauty and grandeur in the movements of the outward man when he says to iago so touchingly leave me leave me iago and turning from him walks to the back of the stage raising his hands and bringing them down upon his head with clasped fingers and stands thus with his back to us there is a grace and majesty in his figure which we look on with admiration talking of these things in keen is something like reading the beauties of shakespeare for he is as true in the subordinate as in the great parts but he must be content to share with other men of genius and think himself fortunate if one in a hundred sees his lesser beauties and marks the truth and delicacy of his underplaying for instance 
when he has no share in the action going on, he is not busy in putting himself into attitudes to draw attention, but stands or sits in a simple posture, like one with an engaged mind. His countenance, too, is in a state of ordinary repose, with but a slight general expression of the character of his thoughts. For this is all the face shows, when the mind is taken up in silence with its own reflections. It does not assume marked or violent expressions, as in soliloquy, when a man gives utterance to his thoughts, though alone the charmed rest of the body is broken. He speaks in his gestures, too, and the countenance is put into a sympathizing action. I was first struck with this in his Hamlet, for the deep and quiet interest so marked in Hamlet made the justness of Keane's playing in this respect the more obvious, and since then I have observed him attentively and have found the same true acting in his other characters. This right conception of situation and its general effect seems to require almost as much genius as his conceptions of his characters, and indeed may be considered as one with them. He deserves praise for it, for there is, for there is so much of the subtlety of nature in it, if one may speak so, that while a few are able, with his help, to put themselves into the situation and perceive the justness of his acting in it, the rest, both those who like him upon the whole, as well as those who profess to see little in him, will be apt to let it pass by without observing it. Like most men, however, Keane receives a partial reward, at least for his sacrifice of the praise of the many to what he feels to be the truth. For when he passes from the state of natural repose, even into that of general motion and ordinary discourse, he is immediately filled with a spirit and life, which he makes every one feel who is not armor-proof against him. This helps to the sparkling brightness and warmth of his playing, the grand secret of which, like that of colors in a picture, lies in a just contrast. We can all speculate concerning the general rules upon this, but when the man of genius gives us their results, how few are there who can trace them out with an observant eye, or look with a discerning satisfaction upon the great whole? Perhaps this very beauty in Keen has helped to an opinion, which no doubt is true, that he is at times too sharp and abrupt. I well remember, while once looking at a picture in which the shadow of a mountain fell in strong outline upon a part of a stream. I overheard some quite sensible people expressing their wonder that the artist should have made the water of two colors, seeing it was all one and the same thing. Instances of Keane's keeping of situations were striking in the opening of the trial scene in The Iron Chest and in Hamlet, when the father's ghost tells the story of his death. The composure to which he is bent up in the former must be present with all who saw him, and, though from the immediate purpose shall I pass by the startling and appalling change when madness seized upon his brain with the swiftness and power of a fanged monster. Wonderfully, as this last part was played, we cannot well imagine how much the previous calm and the suddenness of the unlooked-for change from it added to the terror of the scene. The temple stood fixed on its foundations. The earthquake shook it, and it was a heap. Is this one of Keane's violent contrasts? While Keane listened in Hamlet to the father's story, the entire man was absorbed in deep attention mingled with a tempered awe. His posture was simple, with a slight inclination forward. The spirit was the spirit of his father, whom he had loved and reverenced, and who was to that moment ever present in his thoughts. The first superstitious terror at meeting him had passed off. 
the account of his father's appearance given him by horatio and the watch and his having followed him some distance had in a degree familiarized him to the sight and he stood before us in the stillness of one who was to hear then or never what was to be told but without that eager reaching forward which other players give and which would be right perhaps in any character but that of hamlet who connects the past and what is to come with the present and mingles reflection with his immediate feelings however deep for an instance of keen's familiar and if i may be allowed to term domestic acting the first scene in the fourth act of his sir giles overreach may be taken his manner at meeting lovell and through the conversation with him the way in which he turns his chair and leans upon it were as easy and natural as they could have been in real life had sir giles been actually existing and engaged at that moment in conversation in lovell's room it is in these things scarcely less than in the more prominent parts of his playing that keen shows himself the great actor he must always make a deep impression but to suppose the world at large capable of a right estimate of his different powers would be forming a judgment against everyday proof the gradual manner in which the character of his playing has opened upon me satisfies me that in acting as in everything else however deep may be the first effect of genius upon us we come slowly and through study to a perception of its minute beauties and delicate characteristics after all the greater part of men seldom get beyond the first general impression as there must needs go a modicum of fault-finding along with commendation it may be well to remark that keen plays his hands too much at times and moves about the dress over his breast and neck too frequently in his hurried and impatient passages and that he does not always adhere with sufficient accuracy to the received readings of shakespeare and that the effect would be greater upon the whole were he to be more sparing of sudden changes from violent voice and gesticulation to a low conversation tone and subdued manner his frequent use of these in sir giles overreach is with good effect for sir giles is playing his part so too in lear for lear's passions are gusty and shifting but in the main it is a kind of playing too marked and striking to bear so frequent repetition and had better sometimes be spared where considered alone it might be properly enough used for the sake of bringing it in at some other place with greater effect it is well to speak of these defects for though the little faults of genius in themselves considered but slightly affect those who can enter into its true character yet such are made impatient at the thought that an opportunity is given those to carp who know not how to command though i have taken up a good deal of room i must end without speaking of many things which occur to me some will be of the opinion that i have already said enough thinking of keen as i do i could not honestly have said less for i hold it to be a low and wicked thing to keep back from merit of any kind its due and with steel that there is something wonderful in the narrowness of those minds which can be pleased and be barren of bounty to those who please them although the self-important out of self-concern give praise sparingly and the main measure there is by their likings or dislikings of a man and the good even are often slow to allow the talents of the faulty their due lest they bring the evil to repute yet it is the wiser as well as the honester course not to disparage an excellence because it neighbours upon a fault or to take away 
from another what is his right with a view to our own name nor to rest our character for discernment upon the promptings of an unkind heart where god has not feared to bestow great powers we may not fear giving them their due nor need we be parsimonious of commendation as if there were but a certain quantity for distribution and our liberality would be to our loss nor should we hold it safe to detract from another's merit as if we could always keep the world blind lest we live to see him whom we disparaged praised and whom we hated loved whatever be his failings give every man a full and ready commendation for that in which he excels it will do good to our own hearts while it cheers his nor will it bring our judgment into question with the discerning for enthusiasm for what is great does not argue such an unhappy want of discrimination as that measured and cold approval which is bestowed alike upon men of mediocrity and upon those of gifted minds gifts by ralph waldo emerson gifts of one who loved me twas high time they came when he ceased to love me time they stopped for shame it is said that the world is in a state of bankruptcy that the world owes the world more than the world can pay and ought to go into chancery and be sold i do not think this general insolvency which involves in some sort all the population to be the reason of the difficulty experienced at christmas and new year and other times in bestowing gifts since it is always so pleasant to be generous though very vexatious to pay debts but the impediment lies in the choosing if at any time it comes into my head that a present is due from me to somebody i am puzzled what to give until the opportunity is gone flowers and fruits are always fit presents flowers because they are a proud assertion that a ray of beauty outvalues all the utilities of the world these gay natures contrast with the somewhat stern countenance of ordinary nature they are like music heard out of a workhouse nature does not cocker us we are children not pets she is not fond everything is dealt to us without fear or favour after severe universal laws yet these delicate flowers look like the frolic and interference of love and beauty men used to tell us that we love flattery even though we are not deceived by it because it shows that we are of importance enough to be courted something like that pleasure the flowers give us what am i to whom these sweet hints are addressed fruits are acceptable gifts because they are the flower of commodities and admit of fantastic values being attached to them if a man should send to me to come a hundred miles to visit him and should set before me a basket of fine summer fruit i should think there was some proportion between the labor and the reward for common gifts necessity makes pertinences and beauty every day and one is glad when an imperative leaves him no option since if the man at the door have no shoes you have not to consider whether you could procure him a paint-box and as it is always pleasing to see a man eat bread or drink water in the house or out of doors so it is always a great satisfaction to supply these first wants necessity does everything well in our condition of universal dependence it seems heroic to let the petitioner be the judge of his necessity and to give all that is asked though at great inconvenience if it be a fantastic desire it is better to leave to others the office of punishing him 
I can think of many parts I should prefer playing to that of the Furies. Next to things of necessity, the rule for a gift, which one of my friends prescribed, is that we might convey to some person that which properly belonged to his character, and was easily associated with him in thought. But our tokens of compliment and love are for the most part barbarous. Rings and other jewels are not gifts, but apologies for gifts. The only gift is a portion of thyself. Thou must bleed for me. Therefore the poet brings his poem. The shepherd is lamb, the farmer corn, the miner a gem, the sailor coral and shells, the painter his picture, the girl a handkerchief of her own sewing. This is right and pleasing, for it restores society in so far to the primary basis when a man's biography is conveyed in his gift, and every man's wealth is an index of his merit. But it is a cold, lifeless business when you go to the shops to buy me something which does not represent your life and talent, but a goldsmith's. This is fit for kings and rich men who represent kings and a false state of property to make presents of gold and silver stuffs as a kind of symbolical sin-offering or payment of blackmail. The law of benefits is a difficult challenge which requires careful sailing or rude boats. It is not the office of a man to receive gifts. How dare you give them? We wish to be self-sustained. We do not quite forgive a giver. The hand that feeds us is in some danger of being bitten. We can receive anything from love, for that is a way of receiving it from ourselves, but not from anyone who assumes to bestow. We sometimes hate the meat which we eat, because there seems something of degrading dependence in living by it. Brother, if Jove to thee a present make, take heed that from his hands thou nothing take. We ask the whole, nothing less will content us. We arraign society, if it do not give us, besides earth and fire and water, opportunity, love, reverence, and objects of veneration. He is a good man who can receive a gift well. We are either glad or sorry at the gift, and both emotions are unbecoming. Some violence, I think, is done, some degradation born, when I rejoice or grieve at a gift. I am sorry when my independence is invaded, or when a gift comes from such as do not know my spirit, and so the act is not supported. And if the gift pleases me overmuch, then I should be ashamed that the donor should read my heart and see that I love his commodity and not him. The gift, to be true, must be the flowing of the giver unto me, correspondent to my flowing unto him. When the waters are at level, then my goods pass to him and his to me. All his are mine, all mine his, I say to him. How can you give me this pot of oil or this flagon of wine? when your own oil and wine is mine. Which belief of mine this gift seems to deny? Hence the fitness of beautiful, not useful things for gifts. This giving is flat usurpation, and therefore when the beneficiary is ungrateful, as all beneficiaries hate all timons, not at all considering the value of the gift, but looking back to the greater store it was taken from, I rather sympathize with the beneficiary than with the anger of my lord Timon. For the expectation of gratitude is mean, and is continually punished by the total insensibility of the obliged person. It is a great happiness to get off without injury and heart burning from one who has had the ill luck to be served by you. It is a very onerous business, this of being served, and the debtor naturally wishes to give you a slap. A golden text for these gentlemen is that which I do admire in the Buddhist, 
who never thanks and who says, Do not flatter your benefactors. The reason for these discords I conceive to be that there is no commensurability between a man and any gift. You cannot give anything to a magnanimous person. After you have served him, he at once puts you in debt by his magnanimity. The service a man renders his friend is trivial and selfish compared with the service he knows his friend stood in readiness to yield him, alike before he had begun to serve his friend and now also. Compared with that good will I bear my friend, the benefit it is in my power to render him seems small. Besides, our action on each other, good as well as evil, is so incidental and at random that we can seldom hear the acknowledgments of any person who would thank us for a benefit without some shame and humiliation. We can rarely strike a direct stroke, but must be content with an oblique one. We seldom have the satisfaction of yielding a direct benefit which is directly received, but rectitude scatters favors on every side without knowing it, and receives with wonder the thanks of all people. I fear to breathe any treason against the majesty of love, which is the genius and god of gifts, and to whom we must not affect to prescribe. Let him give kingdoms or flower-leaves indifferently. There are persons from whom we always expect fairy tokens. Let us not cease to expect them. This is prerogative, and not to be limited by our municipal rules. For the rest, I like to see that we cannot be bought and sold. The best of hospitality and of generosity is also not in the will, but in fate. I find that I am not much to you. You do not need me. You do not feel me. Then am I thrust out of doors, though you proffer me house and lands. No services are of any value, just only likeness. When I have attempted to join myself to others by services, it proved an intellectual trick. No more. They eat your service like apples, and leave you out, but love them, and they feel you and delight in you all the time. Uses of Great Men by Ralph Waldo Emerson It is natural to believe in great men. If the companions of our childhood should turn out to be heroes, and their condition regal, it would not surprise us. All mythology opens with demigods, and the circumstance is high and poetic. That is, their genius is paramount. In the legends of Guatemala, the first men ate the earth and found it deliciously sweet. Nature seems to exist for the excellent. The world is upheld by the veracity of good men. They make the earth wholesome. They who lived with them found life glad and nutritious. Life is sweet and tolerable only in our belief in such society. And actually or ideally we manage to live with superiors. We call our children and our lands by their names. Their names are wrought into the verbs of language, their works and effigies are in our houses, and every circumstance of the day recalls an anecdote of them. The search after the great is the dream of youth and the most serious occupation of manhood. We travel into foreign parts to find his works, if possible, to get a glimpse of him. But we are put off with fortune instead. You say the English are practical, the Germans are hospitable. In Valencia the climate is delicious, and in the hills of the Sacramento there is gold for the gathering. Yes, but I do not travel to find comfortable, rich, and hospitable people, or clear sky, or ingots that cost too much. But if there were any magnet 
that would point to the countries and houses where are the persons who are intrinsically rich and powerful i would sell all and buy it and put myself on the road to-day the race goes with us on their credit the knowledge that in the city is a man who invented the railroad raises the credit of all the citizens but enormous populations if they be beggars are disgusting like moving cheese like hills of ants or of fleas the more the worse our religion is the love and cherishing of these patrons the gods of fable are the shining moments of great men we run all our vessels into one mould our colossal theologies of judaism christism buddhism mohammedism are the necessary and structural action of the human mind the student of history is like a man going into a warehouse to buy clothes or carpets he fancies he has a new article if he go to the factory he shall find that his new stuff still repeats the scrolls and rosettes which are found on the interior walls of the pyramids of thebes our theism is the purification of the human mind man can paint or make or think nothing but man he believes that the great material elements had their origins from his thought and our philosophy finds one essence collected or distributed if now we proceed to inquire into the kinds of service we derive from others let us be warned of the danger of modern studies and begin low enough we must not contend against love or deny the substantial existence of other people i know not what would happen to us we have social strengths our affection towards others creates a sort of vantage or purchase which nothing will supply i can do that by another which i cannot do alone i can say to you what i cannot first say to myself other men are lenses through which we read our own minds each man seeks those of different quality from his own and such as are good of their kind that is he seeks other men and the other rest the stronger the nature the more it is reactive let us have the quality pure a little genius let us leave alone a main difference betwixt men is whether they attend their own affair or not man is that noble endogenous plant which grows like the palm from within outward his own affair though impossible to others he can open with celerity and in sport it is easy to sugar to be sweet and to nitre to be salt we take a great deal of pains to waylay and entrap that which of itself will fall into our hands i count him a great man who inhabits a higher sphere of thought into which other men rise with labour and difficulty he has but to open his eyes to see things in a true light and in large relations whilst they must make painful corrections and keep a vigilant eye on many sources of error his service to us is of like sort it costs a beautiful person no exertion to paint her image on our eyes yet how splendid is that benefit it costs no more for a wise soul to convey his quality to other men and every one can do his best thing easiest peu de moyens beaucoup de fait he is great who is what he is from nature and who never reminds us of others but he must be related to us and our life receive from him some promise of explanation i cannot tell what i would know but i have observed there are persons who in their character and actions answer questions which i have not skill to put one man answers some questions which none of his contemporaries put and is isolated the past and passing religions and philosophies answer some other questions 
certain men affect us as rich possibilities but helpless to themselves and to their times the sport perhaps of some instinct that rules in the air they do not speak to our want but the great are near we know them at sight they satisfy expectation and fall into place what is good is effective generative makes for itself room food and allies a sound apple produces seed a hybrid does not is a man in his place he is constructive fertile magnetic inundating armies with his purpose which is thus executed the river makes its own shores and each legitimate idea makes its own channels and welcome harvests for food institutions for expression weapons to fight with and disciples to explain it the true artist has the planet for his pedestal the adventurer after years of strife has nothing broader than his own shoes our common discourse respects two kinds of use or service from superior men direct giving is agreeable to the early belief of men direct giving of material or metaphysical aid as of health eternal youth fine senses arts of healing magical power and prophecy the boy believes there is a teacher who can sell him wisdom churches believe in imputed merit but in strictness we are not much cognizant of direct serving man is endogenous and education is his unfolding the aid we have from others is mechanical compared with the discoveries of nature in us what is thus learned is delightful in the doing and the effect remains right ethics are central and go from the soul outward gift is contrary to the law of the universe serving others is serving us i must absolve me to myself mind thy affair says the spirit coxcomb would you meddle with the skies or with other people indirect service is left men have a pictorial or representative quality and serve us in the intellect Bayman and swedenborg saw that things were representative men are also representative first of things and secondly of ideas as plants convert the materials into food for animals so each man converts some raw material in nature to human use the inventors of fire electricity magnetism iron lead glass linen silk cotton the makers of tools the inventor of decimal notation the geometer the engineer the musician severally make an easy way for all through unknown and impossible confusions each man is by secret liking connected with some district of nature whose agent and interpreter he is as linnaeus of plants huber of bees fries of lichens van mons of pears dalton of atomic forms euclid of lines newton of fluxions a man is a centre for nature running out threads of relation through everything fluid and solid material and elemental the earth rolls every clod and stone comes to the meridian so every organ function acid crystal grain of dust has its relation to the brain it waits long but its turn comes each plant has its parasite and each created thing its lover and poet justice has already been done to stream to iron to wood to coal to lodestone to iodine to corn and cotton but how few materials are yet used by our arts the mass of creatures and of qualities are still hid and expectant it would seem as if each waited like the enchanted princess in fairy tales for a destined human deliverer each 
must be disenchanted and walk forth to the day in human shape in the history of discovery the ripe and latent truth seems to have fashioned a brain for itself a magnet must be made man in some gilbert or swedenborg or orsted before the general mind can come to entertain its powers if we limit ourselves to the first advantages a sober grace adheres to the mineral and botanic kingdoms which in the highest moments comes up as the charm of nature the glitter of the spar the sureness of affinity the veracity of angles light and darkness heat and cold hunger and food sweet and sour solid liquid and gas circle us round in a wreath of pleasures and by their agreeable quarrel beguile the day of life the eye repeats every day the first eulogy on things he saw that they were good we know where to find them and these performers are relished all the more after a little experience of the pretending races we are entitled also to higher advantages something is wanting to science until it has been humanized the table of logarithms is one thing and its vital play in botany music optics and architecture another there are advancements to numbers anatomy architecture astronomy little suspected at first when by union with intellect and will they ascend into the life and reappear in conversation character and politics but this comes later we speak now only of our acquaintance with them in their own sphere and the way in which they seem to fascinate and draw to them some genius who occupies himself with one thing all his life long the possibility of interpretation lies in the identity of the observer with the observed each material thing has its celestial side has its translation through humanity into the spiritual and necessary sphere where it plays a part as indestructible as any other and to these their ends all things continually ascend the gases gather to the solid firmament the chemic lump arrives at the plant and grows arrives at the quadruped and walks arrives at the man and thinks but also the constituency determines the vote of the representative he is not only representative but participant like can only be known by like the reason why he knows about them is that he is of them he has just come out of nature or from being a part of that thing animated chlorine knows of chlorine and incarnate zinc of zinc their quality makes his career and he can variously publish their virtues because they compose him man made of the dust of the world does not forget his origin and all that is yet inanimate will one day speak and reason unpublished nature will have its whole secret told shall we say that quartz mountains will pulverize into innumerable verners von buchs and beaumonts and the laboratory of the atmosphere holds in solution i know not what burza loses and davies end of section three